place is now. And it's forever. Ghost of my life. Yes. You are concerned about him. And are you concerned about me? Of course I am. Of course you are. Have you ever thought about my responsibilities? Oh, Dick, what are you talking about? Have you ever had a single moment's thought about my responsibilities? Have you ever thought for a single solitary moment about my responsibilities to my employers? Has it ever occurred to you that I have agreed to look after the Overlook Hotel until May the 1st? Does it matter to you at all that the owners have placed their complete confidence and trust in me and that I have signed a letter of agreement, a contract, in which I have accepted that responsibility? Do you have the slightest idea what a moral and ethical principle is, do you? Hello, everybody. We're back. Hello, I'm Shelley Duvall, and this is Fairy Tale Theater. <laughs> We're All doing right. The Shining. Fest. We're doing The Shining, everyone. It's uh, me, Stephen Clud, and... Marlow. Marlow. We are Lost Futures, a Mark Fisher podcast. And today we are going over everything there is to know about The Shining. Or the essay that he wrote in Ghosts of My Life called Home is Where the Haunt is. The Shining's Hauntology. Yeah, I watched The Shining for the first time. Marlo watched The Shining, everyone. For this essay? First impressions. Yeah, I mean, it was good. It's been memed to the point where I kind of feel like I saw it already. Yeah. I've always seen it. it <laughs> You've felt, always seen The Shining. It felt familiar, like a movie I've seen my whole life. Yeah, I mean, it was good. Uh, it's a well-made movie. Like. Yeah, it's also very, like, oh, there's those Kubrick sh tracking shots into another Kubrick tracking shot. Well, you were um, saying that it's very early in the... Well, it's, yeah, basically the, like, literal steady cam apparatus was invented, I think, like, two years before that movie came out. So, like, more than... Even other movies, he was really trying to show off those shots that, like the low tracking floor shots, like that you can really only do with a steady cam. Like following Danny. Yeah, like, yeah, the trike thing and all that shit. So, this is the most blog posty. We talked about the structure and writing style of one of his last essays, and this one is certainly notably stream of consciousy it's very poetical as and is broken up into 11 different subsections it was originally a k-punk post from january 23rd 2006 which i looked up every subsection had a picture that went along with mm. it kind of those things that you could do back in the 2000s blogosphere it was really kind of it Before was a WordPress made your shit look all corporate. Yeah, exactly. The first section is the sound of hauntology, and he starts out with kind of a meditation on how hauntology is inherently sonic. That the pun, the haunt and aunt in French has its own like sonic quality, and hauntology, ontology comes with it in attention to the difference or difference between... Yeah, um, he even does a little disc dash place, which felt very Derrida. Yeah, <laughs> and he talks about phonocentrism and phonography, and he links this with the way in which the sound of the voice for dub artists like... Um, well, he meant he's going... Oh, wow. Ian, Ian Penman yeah. uh, mentions how the dub voice is kind of lost in the dub. Right. Um, and that it's you know an it's an absence is a presence and blah 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 yeah as they do say that's part one he's just laying it out hauntology sonic thing and uh, one thing that a lot of people notice is that the Kubrick film is extremely sonic mm -hmm. um, the next one is uh, the Derrida one ghosts of the real Derrida's neologism i.e. hauntology hauntology uncovers the space between being and nothingness. Which is a reference to Sartre. Okay. Being and nothingness is a book by Sartre, and 
it was kind of a, a big book. It's kind of like being in time and then mm -hmm. being in nothingness, big existential like tomes. And what he's saying here is that Derrida is threading the needle between these ways that you exist and the space in between, you know. Right, and, it's not being, it's not nothingness, it's haunting. Yeah, it's yeah. a spectral quality of, which I think he finds a lot of use out of. Right, so then he kind of takes it to The Shining, which he says... Already he talks about the Kubrick versus King. Yeah, and I think to kind of talk about how the whole work itself works in this in-betweenness and this haunted space, and, you know, that does include the differences and similarities between King and Kubrick. The text and the visual. Yeah. And he says that the novel and the film are both... He's treating him as labyrinth rhizomes, which is a Deleuzian reference. Yes, it's the little fungus that helps the trees talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. And Deleuze related it to something about meaning. <laughs> yes, he does. But in this way, as you mentioned while we were watching The Shining, he kind of links it with the Overlook itself and how... That interlinking kind of mirrors. And now, in my viewing of The Shining, The Shining exists in the space between the film and The Simpsons parody, which I've seen many times. Well, I meant physically, like, the layout of The Overlook also has this kind of rhizome quality to it, where it, it kind of ends and keeps going and doesn't have a... You know, yeah, the twisting hallways. Twisting the hallways. The hedge maze, even, can kind of be thought of in certain ways. And it's inter locking like and the rows of doors. I mean, and, uh, you know, you talk about the tracking shots in the movie and you kind of have a lot of feelings like or even you're a fucking red blood cell flowing through a vein. Like, you have a lot of these tracking shots that are specifically hallway or hedge maze, like very much moving through a space like a real rhizome. Mm -hmm. And he links this with the supernatural. As with Vertigo, in The Shining, it is only when the possibility of supernatural spooks has been laid to rest that we can confront the real ghosts, or the ghosts of the real. Yep. I mean, I think it kind of calls back to the Derrida. He mentioned in the first chapter the, the ghosts interview that he saw on BBC with Derrida that was played late at night that really seemed to influence him. Mm -hmm. So... Number three, the haunted ballroom. And this is where we get into... The music. The music of... So he starts with a quote saying, All of Kubrick's films are fantastically listenable if you use this in the sort of the same sense you use as watchable. Mm. And even that has like a hauntologic, like in betweenness, because like the, the listening is already kind of something that passes through the air right like you're not no i mean the whole soundtrack well, is I mean, pretty haunting i mean there's an ethereal i mean if you're just speaking of the yeah ethereal nature of music and sound you know i mean it is recorded so you do have that but yeah i mean well the, as he says nothing here but us recordings yeah um, and um, then he goes to the caretaker he basically uses that quote to launch into a paragraph he wants to write about how much he likes the caretaker, which we've established he really likes the caretaker. <laughs> that was our last episode, so if you haven't listened to it. Uh, and the song that we started out with, the Al Bowley's It's All Forgotten Now. And one of the caretaker remix of that song. You know, um, slurred down, slowed down. As if it's being heard in the ethereal wireless of the dreaming mind or played through on a winding down gramophone of a memory. Yeah, I mean, it's a very much in the similar sense of, yeah, like you were saying, the etherealness of the music where, you know, I, I mean, I think there was the conceit of the album that he was trying to capture music that, quote, would be played in the gold room uh which is of course not really true because it's a 2000s electronic work but yeah i mean 
this idea of the haunted atmosphere and the weirdness of the overlook being part of the structure of the music. Yeah. Uh, and he links it again back with the voice and dub, which he's constantly throughout this entire book talking about the voice and dub. It makes the voice not a self-possession, but a dispossession, a repossession by the studio detoured through the hidden circuits of the recording console, the singer's voice. So he's kind of linking all of the essays through this. Number four, In the Gold Room. In the Gold Room. This one is really a heavy hitter with the... Yeah, so this one he opens up with a bunch of Jameson. It is by the 20s that the hero is haunted and possessed. Weird Jameson quote that sounds like a Campbell quote. Back to the caretaker essay from last week, how the 20s has this Fitzgerald opulence to it that speaks of a time of excess and kind of manic, celebratory, bourgeois kind of dream fulfillment, right? Yeah, and to that end, uh, for Jameson, the Gold Room Revels bespeak a nostalgia for the moment in which a genuine American leisure class led by an aggressive, uh, ostentatious public existence in which an American ruling class projected a class conscious and unapologetic image of itself and enjoyed its privileges without guilt openly and armed with its emblems of top hat and champagne glass on the social stage in full view of the other classes. Which, I mean, Knowing Kubrick and knowing how he, uh, Eyes Wide Shut, I think, is the obvious yeah. uh, other one of Kubrick trying to do kind of a sailo thing of look at how disgusting and horrid these rich people are is definitely an element of that movie. I mean, as somebody who is interested especially in Jameson, how did you like how Fisher applied this? He wrote Postmodernism, or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, which is a huge book for Marlowe and May, and a huge book for Fisher. I think Jameson is kind of the perfect person to quote here, where he's really good at deconstructing a lot of the nostalgic aspects of media and, and kind of showing it as... It is, I guess. Well, I mean, I was just kind of rereading the other part of this where he's getting into this idea of, at least in The Shining, it's not necessarily about that time, but about kind of a state of mind that Jack is going through, mm. that Jack comes to believe he would be failing in his duty as a man and a father if he didn't succumb to his desire to kill his wife and child. And it's this sort of... I guess uh, he's kind of drawing this connection between like the bourgeois excess and hedonist consumption the, um, that Jameson's talking about in this uh, notion of Jack's own hedonist consumption as part of his duty. It's almost like he's being in, having the inversion of what the ghosts are experiencing. Right. Like the ghosts are experiencing or projecting this leisureliness, whereas Jack is going through a real tough time as admittedly like a worker. I mean, and I guess the book supposedly makes it clear that like there's kind of this quest he's being set up on by the ghosts mm. to become the manager. Or That's... to realize his own Well, status. I mean, in the, like in the book, I think there's this whole like kind of dreamy like idea where he's like he's always been the caretaker and he's trying to be the manager and like he needs to do this to be the manager and mm. that sort of so it's like a he, he's rising through the ranks mm -hmm. of the yeah something overlook. like that i mean i haven't actually read the book so could be totally wrong but i know there's more of an overt you need to do this to be the manager don't you want to be the manager thing going on in the book so they kind of like dangle it in front mm -hmm. of his face as yeah like yeah a, 
Yeah, okay. Which has its own class. Yeah, you know, it just kind of go through the next paragraph <laughs> live on the podcast. I swear I've read this before. Well, but, no, uh, that's the thing about this essay is, listener, like, I thought it was going to be an easy essay because I'd seen The Shining. It's very dense. Yeah, it's a very weird essay that's, like I said, stream of consciousness. And, and almost... Like the uh, overlook, it just kind of takes you this way and that way, and it doesn't really have... Right. Well, anyway, because I think it's important, though, this idea of... Which Kind of this male space... Well, the gold room seems to be a male space. He's talking with Grady in the men's room, blah, blah, blah. Um, And I have next to that the Joy Division, because it reminded me of what he said about Joy Division being a boys club. Right, but, you know, the house that pays for his drinks faces up to his man's burden, the space in which he can succumb to the injunction of the maternal superego in joy. Uh, I think it's all very much relating this idea of the 20s bourgeois class and his manly duty to kill his family and this idea of seeking pleasure in in this sort of Freudian jouissance way that I don't entirely understand is all kind of dancing around the same idea of this functional hedonism or this duty to consume or man's burden kind of also reminds me at least of like the bourgeois view of their own burden to lead and i don't think that's completely out of character with this essay because he does speak a lot about both freud and and applying freud to you know a marxist reading of things and a marxist critique of the bourgeois that kind of gets us into the next section. Um, well, I mean, he also really wraps it up with one is authorized to interpret that place as substituting for the genital organs in the maternal body. I think is just. Well, that's a Freud quote. Uh, it's, oh, I when noticed. someone dreams of a locality or a landscape, according to Freud, and while dreaming thinks, I know this, I've been here before, one is authorized to interpret that place as substituting for the genital organs in the maternal body. So this is obviously relating to the shining quote of uh, the first time I was here, I felt like I was here before or whatever the hell exactly he said so i think we're really arriving at the overlook hotel is jack torrance's penis <laughs> or he's sticking his penis into the overlook right isn't the oh i see I isn't see. isn't the place is the maternal oh, okay so the overlook is his mom's vagina well i guess duval's kind of like an interloper at that point right yeah yeah i mean i think certainly so so Yeah, no, I mean, she's trying to get between him and the Overlook. That is what kind of leads him to go crazy. Wow, I didn't think about it that. (laughs) But yeah, no, that's... Yeah, okay, cool. Marlo found it. Marlo found the the, the key. I figured out what Kubrick was saying this whole time. (laughs) We do not need to explore that anymore. (laughs) No need to put out a video essay ever the fuck again on this movie. The Overlook, Jack's mom's vagina... Yeah, and Shelley Duvall is the interloper who must be stopped. So she's essentially the father in that case. Yes, okay, I'm seeing and, this. And he needs to kill <laughs> He's, Shelley Duvall. She's the substitute, right? Yeah, yeah, Danny and Danny and Shelley Duvall are the collective father figure, which leads us nicely into the next section. Whoa, whoa Marlo, you're blowing my mind this with out. this analysis. Um, and they're trying to stop him from fucking the Overlook mom. All right, that really clears up the next section. Yeah, no, we were kind of talking about this section going in. Number five, patriarchy, hauntology. This is the one that we were just wrestling with. It's three fucking sentences long. (laughs) Um, I just have to also point that out. It's it's not very long. Um, But it, it it is good that we got through that 
Is it Freud's before. thesis first advanced in totem and taboo and then repeated with a difference in Moses and monotheism simply this? Patriarchy is ontology. I'm not sure it is because that word didn't exist when Freud was alive. <laughs> right. <laughs> but this is another thing that kind of Fisher does repeatedly right, right, throughout this right. book. Fisher is fucking famous for that ever since. <laughs> is Marxism nothing if not accelerationism? And it's like, yeah, I guess. Um... <laughs> We'll get that in later season, but he does Back like pneumonology, everybody. He likes to do this where he retroactively fits his pet idea into I believe a it preview. was Mark Twain who famously said, This is hauntology. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so anyway, me Totem and, Steve, and Taboo. Yeah, we me and Steve quickly wikipedia both of these books 20 seconds before we started recording. <laughs> uh, and basically they are essentially both books that tell a meta myth that is, what if a guy killed his father and then felt guilty about that and then started either all of society or just Judaism over it? It is basically the thesis of both of these books. Sorry if you're a Freud head. Uh, that's what the books are about. <laughs> the, the many Freud heads this that are... This <laughs> seems to be essentially how Mark Fisher is using both of these books. Yeah, that's the application for uh, sure. So. And Patriarchy is a Hauntology. What is th it, it reminds me of The Family is a Haunted Structure. Yeah, yeah. And that would make sense. I mean, it is a thing that lives in the tension between what is promised and what is not there and is the patriarchy i think in many ways I, I was talking about this yesterday but it's a thing that you kind of can see and draw power from and recognize as a structure that you as a man going through the world can use in abusive ways and and also enrich yourself with it and get pleasure and enjoyment out of it yeah i mean i think also one of the haunted uh, aspects of patriarchy is our ability to call it patriarchy implies at once that it, it isn't socially acceptable but also of course it exists through structures structures of society that are enforced yeah and also like when you call it patriarchy and you recognize it and you call it by its name it kind of almost a shaming quality right, to it right but at the same time there is also there's a pleasurable quality yeah and to, also you're doing it you're trying to rebuild these supposed lost structures of society that were promised to you and you know or whatever in your place as a man that you know you exist as this category and thing and, and, and you can only and you can only rebuild it if you recognize it as lost. Exactly. Yeah, anyway, that was our, me and Steve just interestingly considering that statement. I don't know what it has to do with what Fisher wrote necessarily, <laughs> or The Shining for that matter, but me and Steve were trying to figure out in what way, because, you know, the obvious, I think, Oedipal reading is surely Danny is the one who kills his father in the movie. Uh, Literally, it at least has an implicit hand in his death. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, kills him in a kind of tricky and, uh, way, but it kills him, a little and, home alone -y, but... Um, and, and throughout the whole novel, or the whole movie, also strategizes ways to kill his father. Yeah, and also... Which is... And also has an affectionate relationship with his mother compared to his father. So, you know, that's the obvious edible. But I think that I just solved this question entirely. Right, that the that, father is both of them and that the overlook is the mother. Yes, and Jack is our Oedipus hero of this Mark tale. Fisher, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why didn't you... It's clearly what you actually meant by all this. <laughs> Number six, A History of Violence. All right. This uh, kind of brings us to Jack's abusive patriarchy, really. Yeah, we seem to be walking along this path of trying to say something about patriarchy with this essay. Is it saying something about patriarchy? Yeah, you know. It's, it's an interesting essay. It's in the, it, 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 really, it really is, and it's confounded me every time I've picked it up, and I think we're finally 
I'm getting loose strands of mm -hmm. because even before we started, I was like, Marlo, what's he trying to say here? What what's he trying to say about the shining? And I confidently said, eh, it's numbered. We'll just go through them. <laughs> so here he, he begins with the kind of plot, the first time he talks about the plot. Even before he enters the overlook, Jack is fleeing his ghosts, and the horror, the absolute horror, is that he, Haunter and the Hunted, flees to the place where they are waiting. Such is The Shining's pitiless fatality, and the novel is, if anything, even more brutal in its diagramming of the network of cause and effect, the awful necessity, the generalized determinism of Jack's plight than the film. Jack has a history of violence in both novel and film, The Shining. The Torrance family is haunted by the prospect that Jack will hurt Danny again. This is one thing I didn't, uh, you know, I was reminded on this viewing about. Because I never really picked up, I knew that he was abusive, but, you know, throughout, there, there were so many beat you over the head, like, he's an abuser, he's an abuser, he's an abuser of alcohol, He's an abuser of his son, and he's, at the very least, emotionally abusive of his wife. Neglectful mm -hmm. is, you know, being yeah, kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And re-watching it, you know, it is true that he is, or the family is terrified of him the entire time. Cause, yeah. Because they know that he, right. he yeah, did no, it there, once. There's, and, there's, I mean, it goes honestly well beyond, like, the one time he hurt Danny. It's... There, there's a very clear dynamic where Shelley Duvall is treating him like a woman treats an abuser. Yeah, well, uh, or overly cautiously, you know, there for him. Oh, you okay? You need anything? Oh, you want me to leave? Uh, like that kind of. It's called something specific. Yeah, I, I feel like, like there's over, a fucking like, name for like it. Like over accommodating, kind of. Um, yeah. Cautiously. It's not love bombing. That's the thing the abuser does. I know that. Cautiously, like, tiptoeing around. Right. Yeah. Constantly like, on edge. Constantly. Yeah, constantly on edge. Like, it's, I mean, it comes through very well because, of course, Stanley Kubrick was emotionally abusing Shelley Duvall the entire filming to get that performance out of her. Uh, and he was successful at that. Well, Jack has already snapped, drunkenly attacked Danny. An aberration, a miscalculation, a momentary loss of muscular coordination, a few extra foot pounds of energy per second, per second. That's the quote from. Right, me. and also it goes on to mention in the novel, uh, it's stated he lost his job after he attacked a student. Mm. Yeah, there's a whole buildup of. Jack being an abusive individual, and Mark Fisher kind of just says all this without a fucking point uh, in this section. I'm gonna just say he just kind of poetically describes all the ways in which Jack is stated well, as violent. Well, if we're linking each section, yeah, yeah, that the haunting, if mm. patriarchy is haunting, certainly the violence evoked by somebody who is trying to overcome their strife. Uh, overcome their underprivileged what you were talking about patriarchy trying to retake what has been lost from right, them yeah, yeah. you know there's going to be consequences to the people around there's going to be yes. violence and that is something that any abu abused person will experience with somebody is that they maybe not everyone but it is a common something has been lost and i need to take out revenge on the people closest to me right and I think that that is pretty clear in this movie. Yes. Um, and he says it at the end here. The history of violence goes back even further. One of the things missing from the film, but dealt with at some great length in the novel, is the account of Jack's relationship with his father. It's another version of patriarchy's occult history. Now not so secret. Abuse begetting abuse. Jack is to Danny as Jack's father was to him, and Danny will be to his child, and, right, right. and, and so on. The cycle of abuse continues. Mm -hmm. All the way back to the Indian burial ground that the Overlook Hotel was built on. That's something I didn't realize until I rewatched this and read this essay, the, the, the specific place of the... 
That was also the fucking, like, background of the fucking poltergeist. Like, yeah, it's, it's a very throwaway it, plot device. It's a very that Stephen... That we don't do anymore because it's rude. <laughs> it's a very Stephen King yeah. thing. Yeah, and it's yeah. a very 70s, ooh, let's make something spooky. Uh, it's, it's a very much, like, throwaway excuse of, like, why is this place haunted? I don't know. Well, in the next essay after this one, he links it with, he's like, The Shining uh, is built on one genocide and Beloved is built on slavery, the other genocide. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so I, I don't think it's easy to pass oh, over yeah, no, in the I analysis. Mean, yeah, you can, you can definitely put analysis in it. I'm just saying. Like that America is itself haunted right. by its genocides. Mm -hmm. And so it creates in its culture these myths about. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, just all, I mean, the whole idea of haunting is always a recall of the past. And so, I mean, a ghost is from the past and died and is still existed in the present, even though it shouldn't be. And that's oh, why we are, have been using this word the whole time in the first place. And yeah, just on a very literal level, the haunting of generational violence, patriarchy structures, in the burial grounds, and so forth. Yeah, so we get into part seven. Home is where the haunt is, the name of the essay. Um, the word haunt and all its derivations, he links it to the German word umheilung, which he mentioned before. And often, Yeah, it's a Freud concept. I think it just means uncanny. Well, it's oftentimes translated as uncanny, but oftentimes it goes untranslated because it means like the space in between. Mm-hmm. I think is the exact definition, okay. um, but a lot of people use it as the uncanny. Right. He mentions it in Weird and Eerie as well. Right. The other book that Mark Fisher wrote uh, posthumously after his death. You know, sort of just makes the statement that The Shining exists in this in-between place of melodrama and horror. Mm -hmm. And it... I, I was surprised to read that it's Kubrick's only horror movie. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. That it's the only one that's considered horror. He had actually looked into doing another one, but passed it. A, he compares it to Cronenberg. And well, History the, of Violence starring Viggo Mortenstein. I don't think I've seen that movie. I think I might have seen it when it came out and then never saw it again and also didn't realize it was Cronenberg at the time. A lot of Cronenberg movies, I don't realize they are Cronenberg yeah. until after the fact. Yeah, I mean, I know the general plot is kind of a born identity thing, but like he used to be a hitman, but he doesn't remember he was a hitman. And, and some people are like, hey, you're that old hitman. We're going to be all violent towards you. And then he's like really good at like karate and shit and <laughs> takes out the people and then has a mystery to solve about who he is and where he came from. And how he came to this small town and these people that all seem pretty friendly. Yeah, and he finishes with a quote from the movie. You would never hurt mommy or me, would you? Number eight, the house always wins. Uh, that's another quote from the movie. Yeah, it's probably something Lloyd said at one point. That's what I was thinking. It sounds like if Lloyd didn't say it, he might as well have. <laughs> can all imagine Lloyd saying, but it is, but it is, or Jack said it to Lloyd. It's the concept behind the, like him trading his soul for being, yeah, it's your not, credit's no good here, sir. Uh, orders from the house. I want to know who's paying for my drinks. Yeah. That whole thing. Anyway, this is about, okay. What horrors does the big looming house present? Um, mm. Rebecca, he mentions that's the Hitchcock movie. Right. Yes. Which features a house with a ghostly woman that's yes, the woman Rebecca. before. Yeah. Uh, and Jane Eyre, obviously, is a famous haunting Victorian novel. And uh, she will be unable to take the place of the spectral predecessor. Either way, she has no access to the proper name. Yeah, I mean, is very much relating the always be the caretaker idea, Jack's fatalistic curse to be wedded to this space as like in Rebecca and yeah I mean he says okay well, what horrors does the big living house present for the women of horror drama 
it has threatened non-being either because women will be able to undifferentiate herself from the domestic space or because of or she will be unable to take the place of its spectral predecessor as in rebecca yeah i mean in the general sense jack is stepping into this role it has some echoes of rebecca in that way anyway this is also like really short i just read three quarters of the entire section so (laughs) we're not just doing a light uh reading some of these are very short and they're very dense they're like compact Uh uh-huh i'm sorry to differ with you sir but you are the caretaker you've always been the caretaker i should know sir i've always been here yes uh number nine i'm right behind you danny uh which is another quote which he's linking to a more spectral quality of the relationship between right it seems like kind of an echo of the like generational violence yeah argument from i'm right behind you danny being the that he's always going to follow danny's future Mm -hmm. self no matter what but it's also a throwaway line that he's making as he's chasing him down and how does daddy escape from jack by walking it through his father's footsteps so you know yeah that's really serendipitous uh, really something there <laughs> uh number 10 the no time of trauma i don't know it's the conversation between jack and grady about grady murder suiciding his family grady having no memory the song it's all forgotten now playing fisher thinks all of that's super trippy um <laughs> again i i just you gotta read this yourself i'm not i'm not trying to be superficial here i just literally this is what the fucking thing is saying it's more like a creative project almost yeah well, i mean i again i'm gonna keep going back to that word i used which is uh, stream of consciousness anyway number 11 overlooked i'll just read it in full overlooked colon to look over or at from a higher place to fail to notice or consider miss and that's the entire episode. i i thought i was very deridian i mean just yeah no yeah the whole thing is very much a blog post from the 2000s about <laughs> the shining on this trippy fucking theory blog that you read It sticks out because it's the only one in the entire book that has anything like this. And again, I said it before, but I thought this was going to be an easy one because it... it, It's a thing we've heard of. It's a thing we've heard of. Like, I'd never heard of the caretaker before. I didn't know what he was talking about when he was writing about the caretaker. I knew The Shining and I was like, oh, here's something I know. Mm -hmm. And then it was like... Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I think there's things being i don't know exactly what it's saying but but yeah there's things in it all right everybody till next time we're gonna the next essay is uh another one of those bands you never heard of little axe discussing history of slavery unless you have heard of the band it's the reason that you decided to start listening to this podcast and you've just been hate listening as we continue to be dismissive of the music featured in a book that we both chose to read (laughs) (laughs) all right see you everybody a little slow tonight isn't it (laughs) (laughs) yes it is mr torrance what will it be i'm awfully glad you asked me that lloyd because I just happen to have two twenties and two tens right here in my wallet. I was afraid they were going to be there till next April. So here's what. You slip me a bottle of bourbon, a little glass, and some ice. You can do that, can't you, Lloyd? You're not no, too we're busy, are you? Not a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> not busy at all. $60. Good man. You set him up and I'll knock him back, Lloyd, one by one. White man's burden, Lloyd, my man. White man's burden.